Welcome to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series, a digital program started in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. This week's episode features groundbreaking biopharma executive David Epstein, executive partner at Flagship Pioneer. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hawks Bland, and I'm the CEO at New York Bio. We're thrilled you're joining us again for a um, another Tuesday morning conversation um, with our esteemed guest. Today, we have David Epstein with us, um, who practically needs no introduction, um, but I'll let Derek give him one just because we don't want to leave him out. And we <laughs> are uh, thrilled you're joining us. As always, please put your questions in the Q&A or the chat box, and Derek and I will get to them and pose them to David throughout our conversation today. Um, thank you to Moses and Singer for sponsoring this month's um, series of uh, virtual breakfast. We really appreciate the engagement from everybody, and we look forward to a fantastic conversation today. Derek, over to you. All right, thanks so much, David. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is great. We have a, a rare opportunity to, you know, hear kind of both sides of the spectrum. You have a, had a tremendous career at Novartis, and have followed it by going to Flagship, which has really left, I think, probably an indelible mark on, you know, how companies are started, how they're grown. Uh, and really what the future is going to look like. So again, thanks for having us here. And um, you know, just as a bit of an origin story, why don't you tell us maybe a little bit about how you got where you are, but you know, that would probably take too long. So why don't we talk yeah. a little bit about how you basically went uh, a little bit about Novartis and, uh, and then we'll eventually get to flagship. Sure, happy, happy to do that. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, uh, Derek. I'll try to keep it to the, uh, th the three minute version. Uh, but I'll start with I'll start with high school where I worked for a I worked for a local community pharmacist and then I went and got a bachelor's degree a BS in in pharmacy and like many pharmacists you realize you're somewhat overtrained for um, you know what your actually day to day work is and it became clear to me I needed to do something else I met a fellow named uh, 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 Jan Leslie who was the uh, the head of Squib at the time and I worked for them part time and I went back and got an MBA and worked for Booz Allen, joined Sandoz, which was a predecessor of Novartis company as a new product manager. So I was living in that world in between commercialization and, and R&D, really enjoyed it. Uh, they realized pretty quickly that I could pronounce difficult words like acromegaly and rare, rare tumor types. And I became the sort of the specialty guy there. No one wanted to work on specialty drugs. That's a long time ago. Uh, everything was, you know, the next cardiovascular drug, you know, to lower lipids or blood pressure and the like. So I got all the specialty drugs. I helped Novartis start its oncology business. We grew to become number two in the world behind the Hoffman and Roche in, in oncology. And then one day I, w I got a phone call from Dan Vassello to fly to Basel, Switzerland. Dan was the uh, CEO of uh, Novartis at the time and the chairman. He said, we're making some structural changes. I'm sitting in his office. He says, you have one hour to decide. Do you want to be head of the global pharma business? You have to move to Basel. So I said, yes. <laughs> and uh, I ended up spending six and a half years in, in Switzerland and managed a $33 billion business, 55,000 people and learned a lot about the world. It was, it was absolutely fabulous. Um, very quickly along the way, um, Multiple times, as I'm sure some of the people on this call will realize, you get those phone calls from recruiters or you actually take interviews. And there's those pivotal moments when you make decisions. In my case, just by sheer chance, every time I was about to take another job, I got promoted. It had nothing to do with the fact I was taking another job. It was just luck or unlucky, depending upon your view. So I spent 26 years there. And now, now, now I'm a flagship. When I, when I retired from Novartis uh, four and a half years ago now, um, I actually didn't really understand the biotech community in Boston or San Francisco. Uh, I really didn't know how venture capital worked. I mean, I knew at a high level, right? But I, I really didn't know the day-to-days and what the ecosystem was like. And I was just blown away by how much further these startup companies uh, were pushing the scientific envelope beyond what big pharma companies were doing. You know, big pharma companies get really, really good at doing a couple of things. Uh, whether it be, you know, turning chemicals into drugs, simple proteins, antibodies. But for the most part, uh, you wouldn't in a big company say, I'm going to now do something crazy and turn red blood cells into drugs. I'm not going to mm -hmm. uh, take a new modality like circular RNA. Uh, this is in the newspaper yesterday for the company yeah. called Iran, their flagship. I'm not going to like 
go do all the work to figure out this really can be a new class of medicines. And I just found it extraordinarily exciting. I said, I'll do this. This will be fun. And in, in fact, that's exactly you know what it's turning out to be. Uh, now I am chairman of three public uh, biotech companies. I'm also chairman at the same time of, of a, a bird rescue and rehab and release uh, foundation in Florida, which um, uh, makes life all that much more uh, living, I think. And I'm having a blast and I, I'm looking forward to answering any questions and having a great discussion this morning. And thank you for everybody that that zooming in. That's great. Well, I will ask one other. You say uh, you said that you know you're thinking well that these the venture companies can push things a lot further. You know, one of the big things to your credit is uh, is Gleevec, which really kind of it probably changed how cancer drugs were developed. Certainly, they it changed how we were thinking in terms of targeting patients. And you know, maybe you could just give us a little bit of background there and really kind of what it was like at the time because there was nothing like that you know it was you know th at the time I, I think either the the human genome project had you know recently wrapped up but genomics was definitely you know the 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 wave here but it it certainly wasn't prime time it certainly wasn't as kind of ubiquitous as it is now um and that's really something that i think shifted in terms of how do we how are we actually giving drugs to patients that we think are really going to work yeah, so the time of Gleevec, the other thing that was happening around that time was uh, Roche's Receptin, actually. Those are the two drugs that were, in my opinion, among the most heavily targeted molecules, this idea you could, you could pick out a specific patient population um, and treat them effectively. And at the same time, you, know, you could have the diagnostic available uh, to do that. And because there was a lot of skepticism at the time, you could actually make money mm -hmm. going after a specialty population because and the main reason is you keep patients alive so the population gets bigger and they become very, both of them became very attractive uh, medicines. There were a lot of doubters um, at Novartis and, and, and globally. The first sales forecast for Gleevec was, um, I found it in a file somewhere with $80 million. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, the, and the drug did over, did, drug did over 5 billion. To Cigna, which was the follow molecule, did around 2.5 billion. And then several other companies also had you know, good BCR able inhibitors, and they, those have been billions of dollars. Also, in total, it's probably about a ten billion dollar category. And that, think about that first forecast; that's pretty, yeah. pretty incredible. The other thing that's illustrative now, I can look back from because I have because my venture experience, Gleevec seemed like a huge step out of the ordinary for a big drug company, but mm -hmm. the reality was. Well, you know, we were inhibiting kinases, which were people people were afraid were going to be toxic. It's really just really close to what we were doing anyway. It, it was a, it was an adjacency to what we did, I would describe it. It wasn't like we were taking a newfangled protein and twisting it around and genetically altering it and growing it in a, growing it in a bioreactor and giving it to a patient, which is the kind of stuff that we're doing, doing now. But even that seemed like it was like, wow, are you going to, you're going to take all that risk and do this really novel thing. Um, but in that, in a way encapsulates the difference between the biggest pharma operators in the venture world where the pharma operators, they do innovate, they absolutely do, but they innovate mostly in adjacencies unless they go out and buy a venture company. And, you know, they go out and buy a cart company, they go out and they go out and buy a gene therapy company and like, and then they're in this space. But for the most part in their laboratories, they're not gonna do that crazy stuff. And in part is the timelines are different. They don't get, big companies don't get rewarded for doing that. If you have all, if you have these programs working on some newfangled DNA or RNA therapeutic that's preclinical, you get zero value for it as a big company. But small yep. companies can raise capital against it and, and with the hope that maybe one day they will either sell it or commercial, you know, commercialize it. And that's part of the reason, um, you know, the ecosystem works the, the way it currently does. It's just the way, you know, investors, who are different, you know, want see economic potential. It's just, and this, it's fine. It works out. There's an opportunity in venture as a result. I'm happy for it. Yep. Yep. Even now, I think that the larger companies will probably get a bit better at, at telling uh, kind of stories with multiple threads because everyone now is going to have either cell therapy lines or gene therapy lines, et cetera. There's going to be, you know, there, there's going to be companies that adopt these new modalities and then have kind of the full armamentarium uh, within their pipeline and certainly within their commercial ranks. So 
but but they uh, still have to I get, imagine yeah their challenge if I can interrupt you their their challenge sure. is to choose their, their challenge is to choose you know so you know back in the days when the first antibodies came out okay there's a new modality should we be in or not now there's mm -hmm. 50 new modalities which ones do we actually right. invest yeah. in and do we yeah. do it early or do we wait until they prove themselves most big companies are most not all are taking the perspective i'm going to wait a little while because clearly right. not all of these modalities are going to be the good ones but if you wait right. then instead of paying a few hundred million then you're paying tens of billions and that's the trade-off more of that right yep. yeah there's de-risking and then there's and then there's the next step right which is is yeah there's a price to, yep. to patients so when you uh, when you were actually when you before you went to flagship, you know what were some of your pre -con you you leave Novartis and I don't know how long it took you to get interested in in venture, but what were some of your kind of preconceptions about what venture capital was and and what they did and you know sure. what did you, what did you think of the space before you before you really got introduced to it? Sure. So let me give you a, a segue and answer your question. So when I left Novartis, um, I said I wouldn't work for a year. Actually, my wife told me I wouldn't work for a year. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I moved back from Switzerland um, to Florida and New York, where we had we had a second home in New York, and very quickly started getting phone calls and got more and more excited about this interesting stuff. Um, but I also remembered my promise, and it turned out that at Flagship they had this company called Rubius had 17 employees. They were genetically modifying red blood cells, growing them in bioreactors. I had done the Kim Raya University of Penn deal at Novartis. I'd brought it to Novartis. Mm -hmm. So I understood the potential of uh, a red blood cell platform. That's why I started to work again. But my conceived notion, my, my preconceived notions were, you know, these were small companies, they struggled, they couldn't raise money, they didn't have the same level of talent. Um, you know, they, they were just dreaming that they could make drugs from these platforms. Um, it's just not true. I mean, if you can put together, it's really three things. You can put together good, tech, good technology, um, the right group of experienced entrepreneurial people, capital, and assuming your technology has IP around it, uh, there really is no limit to what, to what you can do. Uh, it's really quite incredible. And I did not understand, particularly in Boston, where I've spent now a lot of time, the quality and the interactivity of the ecosystem up there. I mean, literally, no exaggeration, walking down the street from my apartment, which I was renting at the time, uh, to the office and running into four or five people every morning that were either researchers or clinicians or BD people or venture funders or one of our lawyers. I mean, it was just, it's incredible. And there's very few places in the world where you get that kind of dynamic and it sparks all kinds of creativity and energy. It's it's really quite terrific, you know. And if it wasn't for, if it wasn't for the winter, Boston would be by far the ideal place to be hanging out. I, I know we're on, <laughs> talking about New York bio, but you know, New York has much better winters than than Boston does. They do, they do. <laughs> we'll talk about the baseball team some other time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so actually, in the in in the few years that you've now been at Flagship, your venture has actually changed a lot. Right. So when you got to flagship, the average venture round was twenty two million dollars. And that number has now gone up to forty four million dollars across all the rounds. And the number of rounds that are either over one hundred million dollars or over fifty million dollars have either tripled or quadrupled. So suffice to say that the dynamics within the venture community have absolutely changed in terms of what it means for a I'll call it a quote unquote startup company because it's technically a startup company, but it's not exactly an angel funded shoestring startup anymore. Yeah, so even the numbers you've given, and I don't know what year the 44 million is from, my sense is that even feels low given what's happening today. So I suspect yeah. it's cre cre creeped up. There's probably also a bit of um, divergence between, you know, whether the company started up out of an academic lab, maybe with yeah. a couple of people getting, you know, some angel investing which is still a viable mm -hmm. way to go. And what's coming out of the flagships, Third Rocks, Atlases, you know, Arches and, and the like, Polaris, where uh, they're able to command, you know, more money going into the companies because it is, has been repeatable. Uh, there's been repeatable success. Um, I got to tell you, having enough capital is a double-edged sword. Um, so if you have too much, does it, if you have the wrong management team, you could waste it. Yeah. On the other hand, I got to tell you that the earlier the technology is, the more likely you're going to have to pivot and adjust what you're doing. The first program may feel, fail. You may find manufacturing costs are higher than you expected. The whole bunch of things that 
you may come to realize. And having that money makes the difference between uh, you know, having the fold up shop two years out uh, versus having a second or third chance. And those many companies are second or third chance winners. Agios, for example, yeah. their first set of programs failed. And there's, there's many, many examples where that's been the case. That feels like one of the big things that that's shifted, right? Where you have this this good management team, and if you give a good management team a decent amount of capital, it used to be. It feels like it used to be that every company got its first shot, right? You got a shot with your lead program, and if that didn't work, you know, either the the company got crammed down, or or you went yep. and you restarted and tried to do it again. Now it seems like with more capital, the uh, the funds have been able to basically put in a team that they trust. And like you said, kind of give them a little room to maneuver, right? I forget, I forget which, which company it was, but uh, it was an arch company and it was out in San Diego. I forget how much money that oh, it was. It was Gossamer. Gossamer was started mm -hmm. with basically a check mm -hmm. and a management team and no technology and anything else mm -hmm. famously. So I suppose with, with good management and capital, you can almost, you know, find good technology. And I, I imagine there were more borders around it than that, but you can almost find good technology and give them a way to operate and good management seemingly would be able to pull most things through, if not on the first shot, then maybe on the second shot. Yeah, I agree. So if, when you, when you look at a new company, um, what are some of the ways that you think about in terms of, well, I'll say nurturing CEOs, right? How do you, how do you think about bringing your experience, uh, you know, kind of down to, this company that has probably a different structure or a different focus or, or anything like that. What, what kind of things do you impart uh, on that company after your experience and, and what you've done in your career? Yeah. So I actually, I believe, going back to the issue that people is one of the keys is that it's, it goes and you're hinting on it to it. Now it's not just hiring the right people. It's to the extent that at the top, the CEO and the direct reports become a truly high performing team. And that there's a series of things involved there around getting people to work together in a way that their, their productivity, their energy uh, is much greater than the individual parts. And that comes with having alignment on an exciting vision strategy for the company. It's working through in detail, uh, governance and decision-making, it's, it's having clarity on what kind of culture one wants to build. You, know, you remember for most of these companies, you have people coming in that have worked at many, many other companies or academia. So they're all coming with their own preset understanding of how things should work. Um, when should we communicate? Should we be in a silo? Should we not? Should we share? Um, you know, how do we, uh, if, if we, if we disagree, do we say, it? how do we say it? Um, uh, uh, to what extent do we accept diversity of thought and background in our companies? All these things that, that I think really matter. And it's not unusual that when you're starting up a company, there's so many things going on, you have no time as the CEO to think about this stuff. So culture will be there. It just magically appears, but you might not like what you get. Uh, so I spend time with my CEOs on helping them articulate that vision. So what is that exciting future look like when we deliver on the promise of the company? What is the strategy to get there? Recognizing there's no such thing as a perfect strategy and we may well have to amend it as we go, but it's really good if we all at least agree at what we're doing. Um, being clarity on, getting clarity for the team on deliverables for over a couple of years, but also, you know, also the current year, you know, how are we gonna reward, how are we gonna reward people? Finding the right people, building that high performing team, actually having, discussions with people about what a good culture looks like in the context of that company versus things that we don't want to happen uh, in our company. Those are all things that, you know, I work on, uh, you know, with this, with the CEO. The other thing I do when I, certainly when I'm chair is I help put together a board that's going to be there primarily to help that CEO be successful. There are, unfortunately, there are some boards where you have either people that are disengaged you have people that are just so engaged that you're doing the CEO's job. You have boards where you have, and please don't take me wrong if you're listening, there are too many venture capitalists on the board and they end up fighting with each other over what the direction of the company and the financing strategy should be. You drive the CEO crazy. Uh, you know, and you know, part of the role of the chairman is to make sure we don't be a burden for the CEO, but actually we help. We make introductions. We help them be thoughtful. We help them see what's coming down the road before they get there and they say, I only wish I had done X two, year, two years prior. We help them with fundraising, all, all the things that are gonna be important 
you know, to, to help the company launch in, in the most, you know, hopefully the most effective way. Yep. Um, David, we had a, um, we had a question from the audience that makes a lot of sense here. The question is what is in quotes, good management? Is it just prior success as a management team or individuals, or are there other ways to detect that and measure for that as you're thinking about who you're setting up in your companies? So I don't know if, I don't know if the question's in the context of, you know, hiring or, or the team itself. Um, uh, they're, they're somewhat, you know, hiring, of course, is a bit more challenging because your interactions with the person are more limited. Um, and you may, you, make a wrong, you may make a wrong judgment call. Or what happens a lot in biotech is the people you're hiring are good for the next couple of years for the company, but they are not going to be the people that are going to scale the organization to hundreds or thousands yeah. of employees. Yeah. And that's one of the requirements of the board is to stay on top of that stuff and make sure you're encouraging the CEO to make uh, the changes. But a good management team or a leading management team or what I would like to say a high performing management team, you have a group of people that are totally focused on delivering upon the vision and the goals for that company. They know how to challenge each other. They push each other. They help each other. Uh, they're, they're open with each other. They, they communicate. Um, they are they use their board. They know, they're not afraid of their board. They don't think the board is a burden. They actually use them to open doors for them. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that is a good team and they have to be, have certain skills, right? So besides understanding the technology and progressing the technology platform and the, pre, and the IND enabling studies and the clinical programs, they need to be comfortable going out and talking to dozens and dozens of investors and, and getting no response. Um, and you have to be comfortable with that and you have to be good at it and you have to be real enough um, that the investors are comfortable in taking a risk on you because that's what ultimately what you're doing yeah. yeah they like the technology story hopefully um but at the end they're really betting on you as the, as the ceo and or the chief medical officer or the chief scientific officer right. that's where that's where they're, they're betting the money on and some people just can't do that and let, let me just give you one example and there are many mm -hmm. in pharma for the most part you're taught that you get rewarded by under promising and over delivering right so you talk about in particular, I worked at a Swiss company. You disclose every single possible thing that can go wrong because if you don't, the other people in the room will tell you what it is. You know, and then hope, and then you put a goal up that's okay, but it's certainly not super stretched. And hopefully, you over deliver on it and you get a big bonus. I, I'm, I'm simplifying, simplifying. <laughs> yeah. just to, just just for effect. And I'm sure there's some people in the room that are now irate. But in, in, <laughs> if, you, if, if, if you do that with investors, they'll, they'll they won't invest. If you yeah. go with an investor and say, hey, I got this new cool technology, it, it, I don't know, it somehow gets them to cancer cells in a new and novel way. It's, and it links, it's pretty good. It links, it links two targets together. It's pretty good. But there's 17 things we haven't sorted out yet. And any one of them could kill this program. You'll get zero money. And it's sometimes it's really hard for people to paint the picture of what could be yeah. without lying, without over promising. Yeah. It's what could be, you know, if things if, if we get the right group of people together, if yeah. we get the right capital together, blah, blah, blah. And recognizing it probably won't actually be that thing, but hopefully it will still be something pretty darn good, mm -hmm. you know, that, yeah. that brings value yeah. to patients and brings value back to the investor. At least half the people I talk to cannot tell that story. Yeah. They just are so uncomfortable. And if you're one of those people, do not come to venture because you'll never raise any money. Yep. And it depends, I mean, different people with different, like, right, like I'm a lawyer, right? So my mind is also uh, by training, like, oh, counter reading authorities, right? Like, what, what are the potential pitfalls? Like, what do we look out for? But that doesn't mean you can't navigate past them. Exactly. Um, you're and, just saying, and we, don't put that up front. <laughs> I agree. And we disclose all that stuff. Certainly, if we're going to go public, you know, yeah. read our perspectives. There's a page and a half of the good stuff we're going to do. And there's 19 pages of everything that can go wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's what these things are. And that's, that's the reality. But um, yeah, you just have to be very comfortable. You have to be so excited about what you're doing. Uh, yeah, this is an extreme example, but Elon Musk, uh, and I'm not saying he's the prototypical CEO by any stretch of the imagination, although he did have a good, pretty good Mars skit, I thought, on, on SNL like, yeah. the other night. Um, but he was, you know, he's singly focused on that dream, whatever his, the dream is. He's going to Mars. He's going to have, he's going to yeah. have cars that are electric. They're going to fly. They're going to, you know, they're going to get power from, from solar. And it's like when he say, when he's saying those things originally, people just think he's out of his mind and there's no way he's going to pull it off. And guess what? He's an example of someone that did. Yeah, and then yeah. he gets all the all the and he, he may be the richest man in the world now. I don't know. But, you know, stock price is going down now, so maybe he's not today. But 
but it, you, you know, you, wait 15 not, you minutes, it'll change. Yeah. You don't have to be that extreme. And clearly our business is different because it's patients' lives that are, are at stake, right? So it's not the same, but you have to push in that direction. It, sh it shows you what you, you have to take a step towards that and be comfortable doing it. So this is, uh, I, I like this question. It's a bit of an off the wall question, but uh, so the question is how does flagship create corporate identities like the names and the logos, et cetera. Mm. And this question means a lot to me because one of the startups that I went to had an absolutely terrible name. It was a name that people couldn't say and it was come up with, it was come up with because they, we were enumerating the immune system and people would try it. They couldn't pronounce it. They would make this face when they, when they said it, which in marketing is a terrible thing. If you're making that face, it's not a good thing. So how does flagship actually come up with names so, of companies? Cause they all, yeah, they all just they roll yeah, off the might, tongue. They work. Yeah. You might be disappointed in the answer. So, uh, <laughs> so let me just say how the flagship model works in the, the 30 second version of it. You, you have, six science scientists uh, who work for Nubar Fay and they're, they're in charge essentially, you know, flagship venture labs, uh, flagship pioneering labs. And these guys whiteboard crazy ideas and they ask the what if question. What if we could inject something in the body that would convince, that would teach cells how to make proteins? It became Moderna. What if there was an allogeneic cell that we could genetically modify to turn into a drug? It became Rubius Therapeutic. What if we could manipulate the microbiome uh, in, su in such a way that we could treat C. difficile? It became series, literally with a whiteboard. And when the ideas are conceived at, these, at flagship, no one's talking, for the most part, no one's talking about this stuff. The crazier the idea is, the more excited flagship gets about it. And the reason I'm telling you the story is now that scientist, one of those six people, typically becomes the CEO of the company when we're giving the, the seed capital to test the idea. It's usually three, that mm -hmm. scientist and two other people maybe three other people. And very quickly, they got to do a whole bunch of stuff. Mostly they got to get into the laboratory and they got to test the idea. But at the same time, they're coming up with names, they're coming up with logos. Or, so I got to tell you, sometimes the first names and logos, they stink. I mean, they're, they're hopefully by the time, you know, we're doing a crossover around or an IPO, all that's been fixed and cleaned up. And you yeah. see the the yeah. better version of it, but there's, I've seen some not so nice logos, for example. So, you know, uh, a, a, guy, a guy named Avak Kavajian, uh, who's one of those six people, extraordinarily creative uh, scientist. Um, you know, he, he's the founder of Rubies. He's also the founder of Laurent, which was in the, in the, I think in the, in the Wall Street Journal and BioCentury yesterday. Uh, he, mm -hmm. he did the original, I'll call it clip art for Rubius. And it was this Ruby thing. And I said, and it looked <laughs> ugly. And I said, you can't do this. I mean, it's just so we changed it. I mean, it's just so usually by the time the Series B happens, uh, we bring in a, uh, a fully professional CEO to run the company. And that CEO will look at many things. And one of them is going to be the branding for the company. And, and, we, and we make the, the adjustments. But there's no... Flagship's magic sauce is the process in which they conceive of ideas, test those ideas, raise the capital for those, I, those ideas in you know, sort of almost in outer space, far away from the, you know, uh, the um, adjacent, adjacencies I mentioned earlier, the big farmer does. Mm -hmm. Their magic sauce is not how do we get the best brand. Um, it, it sort of just, it just sort of happens. Yeah. yeah. Now, I thought it was a good question because honestly, it's one of those yeah. things that never really actually gets talked about. And again, from my experience, I've been around with a company with absolutely terrible branding. So I figured yeah. I would ask. And then, yeah, um, and then just I'll give, I'll give yeah. you another example because I'm on the, this is, this is illustrative and then I'll be quick. Uh, so I'm on the board of a company called uh, Valo Health. Uh, Valo is mm -hmm. a, a machine learning AI company run by David Berry. The goal is to revolutionize drug discovery and drug development by using huge computing power, essentially the, the short version of it. They just finished their series B. The company was originally called Integral Health. There's probably a hundred people called the company's called Integral yeah. Something. It wouldn't, yeah. it wouldn't, it wouldn't fly. We had a, re, we, we had a rebrand it for the, for the yeah. Series B. Now it's Valo, B A L O. It has nothing to do with Integral. So just anyway, it's, 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 an, it's a real what, life example. What does it mean? Does it mean anything? Uh, you could talk about developing uh, drugs in a more valuable way. You could, uh, you could stretch it to lots of different <laughs> things. We sure. originally had. We, we have the, the um, uh, let's call it this way, the flywheel of the ecosystem we use around uh, our computing model is called OPAL, it sort of rhymes with Valo. I mean, it's little four letters, you know. 
clever, clever yeah. thing. We'll make it. We'll make it mean what we want it to mean when we know exactly what our company is delivering. Yeah, when it's <laughs> not nice thing about the, bio- I was gonna say when it's not named the same thing as you know, uh, five hundred other you know, like healthcare, you know, uh, primary care clinics somewhere across the country. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. One of the nice things about biotech is if it works, no one really cares what what the name is ultimately. Um, I'm actually I'm glad you brought up Bella because this is this is important, right? There's a ton of uh, companies focused on data and on AI and, and all sorts of things in terms of how we integrate that into drug discovery. So do you think there at some point will be kind of, you know, call it a bit of a reckoning for these AI companies as what they're doing starts to hit the clinic? You know, is that kind of the, is that kind of the lens that we have to view, you know, whether these initial uh, uh, efforts have been successful? Because I, everyone can wave their hands and talk about how AI is going to be revolutionary, and you have skeptics that say it's it's not really doing all that much. Is really is the proof of is the proof you know really in the uh, the the first round of when we hit proof of concept in the clinic? So you know, first of all, the, the topic AI is such a huge umbrella term; it can mean almost anything. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, everybody now is an AI company, I guess, in, in some in some way. Um, mm-hmm. what, what is it fundamentally? Uh, so machine learning in AI at a very fundamental letter, level is the ability to do what humans do, but just with thousands of variables or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of variables instead of just a couple of variables that our individual brains can deal with. So it comes down to the, your ability to feed in the right data sets uh, mm-hmm. and, 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 then, and then refine those algorithms over time, I have every reason to believe we will design better molecules because of because of machine learning. I have every reason to believe we will find new patient subsets to treat um, to match with the right drug. Uh, and I'll give you an example there. So we we've done some work in Parkinson's disease. Um, I know many people know this. Parkinson's disease is not really one disease. And in fact, if you get enough data sets, and we now have it now, we can see at least five discrete populations of people that have different genetic and you know, genetic and proteomic profiles. If that helps you then match a right drug to the right patient population, the odds that you're going to have success in the clinic go way up. Smaller, right. smaller trial. It's basically doing everything the drug industry has been doing in the last decade, you know, designing better drugs for smaller patient populations, but doing it now with you know, 10,000 variables instead, instead of a couple. So there will be lots of successes. I think it will take costs out of drug development. Sure, there'll be some drugs that fail, but I bet you less will mm-hmm. fail than will, will fail design the other way. Many of the big pharma companies are already increment, incrementally integrating aspects of machine learning and artificial intelligence into how they work. Uh, many startup companies, some are focused on a very small sliver you know, they might just make, uh, you know, for example, c- drugs in a certain chemical space using machine learning. Others right. may be looking at patient data sets uh, from one particular uh, perspective to try to select patients. The va- va- why Valo is different uh, and a bit like recursion as another example, uh, but mm-hmm. Valo is even more extensive. It's, we're trying, we have a machine, machine learning component that's well established. We have a medicinal chemistry inside the company we have clinical development. We have acquired um, access um, to large longitudinal data sets that no one else has access to in order to apply the artificial intelligence to guess to select the right patient populations, which will allow us to do different kinds of phase two trials that other companies wouldn't possibly even conceive of, of doing. So I think there's a place for these companies, like everything else, some will work and some won't. Some will be acquired yep. and rolled up because they're just working on a, a small piece. So it's not going. It's not going away. No, I wouldn't think it was. It was going to go away, and that's actually uh, that's a really good answer. So you said you think it's going to take uh, kind of costs out of drug development. Where do you think those are going to come from? So one is just simply speed. Um, things that would take six months back when I was back in Novartis to come up with a drug that hits hits a target and then refining it to get the lead compound, we literally can do it yeah. a couple of weeks, uh, for, for, for example. Uh, the ability to select a patient subset that we wouldn't otherwise conceive of and now run a trial that has half the end, half the number of patients. There you go. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll speed things up and take costs out. So all along the process, there are opportunities to do that. I mean, drug development, we all know this, is just really inefficient. 
at, at, at almost every level. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think as we saw during during COVID, right, we had a number of ways where instead of doing things, in, in general, it's usually a serial process, right? You have step one, step two, step three. And you know, during COVID, for a number of reasons, we were able to kind of run a number of those things in parallel. Mm -hmm. But you know, in general, if you think about projecting over you know an enormous portfolio, you think about um, you think about staggering the risk. You, know, you kind of have these steps, so you have these these checkpoints. It's kind of it's serial for a reason. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's interesting to think about you know ways that that might change because ultimately, you know, really the clock is ticking on when we get therapies to patients. Yep. And I think the that's kind of the thing. Yeah, yeah. And the industry is getting. Point. And the industry has gotten better doing some more things in parallel. I mean, so even mm -hmm. when we were developing the used Gleevec, um, we eventually, I think we got nine or 10 indications in the label. And we did hundreds and hundreds of investigator initiated trials for other, other uses. And we, we, we did that because we saw what actually Roche did with uh, Avastin. We said, hey, you don't have to do everything in sequence. And, and they're right. If you, un if you understand enough of the biology, you can take more risk and do things in parallel. Right. And mm -hmm. if you're able to target populations, your trials are smaller, they're less expensive, sure. you can sure. do that. Right. You're working with different investigators because you're targeting different patient groups. Right. Right. Um, right. We have so a, I'm going to pivot. Oh, Go ahead, Jennifer. Go ahead. I was just going to say, we have a, um, we have a flagship specific question. Um, it says to, um, from our audience, does flagship always start their companies or do they also take in startups and retool them? We don't know how to take companies and we have no due diligence process. So I get calls all the time or emails. Would you look at my really cool science? And I have to write them a short note saying, yeah, it is really cool, but we don't do, we're not, we don't do that. Many other venture firms do exactly that, but it's, it's 98% internally generated. And the 2% that's not, is just because we worked with somebody before and Newbar, who is the CEO of Flagship, decides we're, you know, we're going to put some money against something, but it's it's not the business model. We can't send out a due diligence team. It, we, we don't have anybody to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So we had a really good question here. You mentioned a little bit of this before, and I wanted to make sure that we uh, that we hit on it. And you know, one of the questions here is how diversity and inclusion can impact success, right? Especially when you're either delivering on development goals. Uh, establishing culture, et cetera. So how does that come into your mind now when you think about either building a board or building on a management team? What are some of the ways that you think about that now and that, that you work with your CEOs? Yeah, so this goes back to my Novartis days and you know, people will look at my management teams and you'll see that in almost every case, whatever executive team I had, I, uh, the team was very international in background. And I don't think there was any time in less than 30% you know, of the team was, was female. Uh, or less than 20% of the 20% uh, team had, you know, some other alternate lifestyle, whether it be sexual preference or, some, or something else. And the reason is I enjoy people having different opinions and I don't want to say fighting, but arguing over direction because I think it results in the best decisions. Um, and having people that were more different, uh, it allows just uh, engenders that but also I found that there were groups of there were excellent people that were just not getting the right jobs because they were they were not white males so I took advantage of the opportunity and hired people that were not white males uh, on the team um, at flagship uh, at least the boards I'm on um, we have uh, so the board that has the least amount of female representation has has two women on it um, several have have more than that uh, there are people, alternative sexual lifestyles, there's people from all over the world. I still think we're a bit too white male centric. Um, and part of it is we struggle to find people who have the requisite skills for the boardroom. And it's simply because they didn't get the opportunity in their companies to get to a high enough level. So we do take risk on some people, but you can't have a board of you know, nine people and seven of them you know, just simply don't have the right background. It just won't, they won't function. Um, so that's one of the challenges. As part of the culture for each of the companies, we talk about how do you get people with diverse thought, diverse backgrounds, and it makes the high-performing teamwork even more important because if you come at things differently, ultimately you have to align. You have to have all mm -hmm. those debates and discussions. When you walk out of the room, you all have to be pulling in the same direction. Otherwise, it's, gonna, it's, not, gonna, it's not gonna work. But I don't know if I yep. fully answered the question, but at least it gives you a flavor for how I think about things. Well, and no, I'd say that's a good answer. I was going to say, Go ahead, in Jennifer. New York Bio, like a lot of other, like Mass Bio and CLSA and other state biotech associations are working now. We have initiatives to look at 
not only supporting diverse entrepreneurs, right, which can then lead to their opportunities growing, but also supporting um, increasing the number of diverse students that are interested in science. So we have to have those students become interested in entering the scientific field in order to continue to have a pipeline of diverse talent that will rise up and be prepared and be ready for the board positions that you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, and they have to, you know, to, you know, with the exception of the, you know, the scientific brainiac that's going to be in the room, you need to also have some kind of leadership and management skills is the other part, right? Otherwise, you just, you know, you can't be, you can't be disruptive. I mean, it's, there's that balance between how do I deliver the message and advocate for what I want and get the organization to switch direction without disrupting everything. And, and they also got to lead people. And that's, that's often one of the, one of the challenges. Yeah. Yep. So this is uh this is an interesting question and I'll apologize for this one in advance. Uh, so it says the flagship team has many different titles, executive partner, origination partner, CEO partner, general partner, managing partner, and oper operating partner and more. What does it all mean? So probably if you ask Newbar, they, <laughs> they give you the definition of each. Uh, as far as, as far, I think the simple version is flagship is a pretty flat organization. Uh, you know, you either carry the partner title or you don't. I don't think mm -hmm. you can really distinguish easily between those different partner titles. We don't care what we call each other at work. We say, hey, you, or we say, hey, hey Avak, or uh, hi, Steven, you know, we don't use our titles. Most of us don't care about those trappings. We care about turning the science into great medicines. And, you yeah. know, hope, we, hope to, we obviously hope to make money when, if our companies are successful, but things like titles don't matter to us very much. Those titles pretty much evolve. No one, I don't, as far as I know, no one has sat down and say, does it make, you know, should we recast the titles? I, when I, one of the things I did early in my career is I drove the integration of Sandoz and uh, Sibagagi. Mm -hmm. I did North mm -hmm. America and I had to make all the titles sort of fit up and all the pay grades. What a thankless <laughs> job that was. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, that, that does not, that does not sound like fun. Everyone is invested yep. in what they already had, what their title was, mm -hmm. and what their yes. And so you're yeah. just gonna you're just gonna disappoint people. Yep. yep. No, you can't you you can't win on uh, yep. on that one. So with uh, a couple of things recently. So if you think about uh, companies like Beer, where George Skangos is the CEO, mm -hmm. and now Roger Roger Perlmutter was just announced as the CEO of, of Icon that uh, Lux just funded. Would you ever want to be a CEO again? So in a way, I was a CEO. So um, when I learned about Rubius and I, and I talked to Nubar and told me I had a really cool company, he said, do you want to be CEO? And I, my answer was over my dead body. I said, I just was. I don't want to do it again. And then he, I'll say he tricked me. Um, that's not really fair. I'm exaggerating. He said, how about, exe he said, how about executive chair? Uh, and I didn't know, working in a big company, I didn't really know what executive chair meant. Executive chair is basically <laughs> part, basically means, it basically means you're the chairman and you're part-time CEO. And then you have yep. <laughs> usually a president or a chief operating officer that actually does the day-to-day. -day. That's what we did. Um, that was fine. Would I do it again? It's possible. Um, do I need to? No. So there was a time in my Novartis career that next job was important to me um, mm -hmm. for a variety of different reasons. I don't have that need anymore. Now, if there was one of our companies, you know, needed me to be CEO for some period of time, and I thought the, te the technology was fabulous, sure, I might, I might do it. I wouldn't exclude that possibility. I don't think I'd want to be a global CEO again. Um, and the reason is really simple. It's really fun to see the world. It's really, it's really cool, all the trappings of those jobs. But you are jet lagged all the time. You have no personal life. Uh, you are, you can't walk down the street without being recognized in these big companies. I don't want to do that part again. I think that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's more than fair. Um, so when you think about things now, right, what are some of the things that, you know, do you actually play in, uh, in the, in the ideation process and in, in the whiteboard process? What are the, some of the things where, you kind of, you know, think about, think about what might be and, and think about the places where, you know, if you, if you could draw something up, what would it be? What are kind of the next things that you would love to see on the horizon? Yeah. So I don't do the, the whiteboarding process. These are, these are people that understand immunology, cell biology at a level that I, you know, I understand enough of the words that I can ask them questions and maybe hire people mm -hmm. to do the work. Uh, I don't do that. Typically my, I mean, I, I see what flagship's doing, so I'm aware of it. 
And some of it's exciting and some of it I don't yet understand. And some of it I think that's dumb. Why are we doing that? Um, <laughs> but for the most part, I get involved when we raise a Series B. Series B is the first time flagship takes external money. It's the first time okay. we hire an external CEO and start to build a team. And the technology has enough heft that you can start to envision what the medicines might look like. Mm -hmm. And where I'm good is, is putting the other vision, you know, helping the CEO write a deck, attracting the people, aligning the team, helping raise the money. So that's when I get involved. So I'm the series B and beyond guy is the way I describe yeah. my job. So, so that, how much of your time, go ahead, Jennifer. No, 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 go ahead, Derek. I was gonna say, how much time do you spend with you know, say, you know, other folks within within venture at these larger funds, either talking about uh, larger vision stuff, because I imagine they also have, you know, I, I imagine Arch also has stuff that they're baking that is similarly just as crazy as the stuff that uh, that David Berry puts on a whiteboard, right? Sure. So how much time do you spend with those guys talking about, you know, what kind of things are coming down the pipe and, and that kind of thing? Because I imagine there's a decent amount of alignment in terms of where yeah. can we put capital work and, and wanting to work on kind of similar types of big things. So until we do an external raise, which is the series B, we don't talk about it at all. Because what we're doing is we're, we're building the team. We're not sure it's going to work and we're filing IP like crazy. So yeah. we do not talk about anything into that series B. And then, then we'll talk right. to others. Sometimes we'll find that someone's doing something similar. There's been a rare, there's been a few rare occasions, very rare where the technology between the companies were so complementary, we've actually put them together, you know, a, you know, a flagship and an arch company, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that has happened. It's just rare. Yeah. Sure. Um, so we actually had a question and I think, I think it fits here. Um, although from the flagship perspective, if, if from your perspective, starting at sort of the series B, but it's um, the question is about tranched capital. And it says we often find see large announced financing number that's tranched and we've seen some companies fold rather than continue to draw down previously announced capital. So it's based on this, do you have a thought regarding tranche rounds? Yeah. So we tr sometimes we tranche internally our series A because yeah. we're not yet convinced that the technology has legs. So we might tell the team you're getting 25 million, but you're only getting nine right now, 10 right now until you prove X in, in the lab. Yeah. But that's all internal. But I have not been involved in, doesn't mean I've, I haven't seen all the deals, but I have not been involved in any Series B or C deal where we tranche the capital. We just don't do it. Um, now, then again, we have a lot of control. So in the event that the company was going off the rails, we would just fold it, right? And it doesn't happen often, mm -hmm. but you can, you can do that. So you could argue we... You, if you want to be, you want to be, um, take the extreme view, you can say it's all tranched every penny in a way, because you can always shut it yeah. down. But we don't, we don't think that's helpful actually to, to tranche capital like that. And we're not investors from that perspective. We want to build great breakthrough companies. And we, like I said earlier, we're banking on the management team to be able to pivot to something close nearby or, or a completely new idea with, with the capital. We put that team together for a reason. It's not like we're just going to give you a few million bucks and if you fail, you, you go away. We, we, we don't have that model. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think about the, uh, how do you think about kind of the transition, so to speak, between, you know, private and public being, I would say, faster these days, whether it's via SPAC, whether it's via IPO, given the amount of, of money people raise privately. Uh, do you see this as just, you know, a, a good and healthy amount of available capital? Do you see this as a risk? Um, and do you think the pendulum is ever going to swing back the other way? Yeah. So yeah, there's a pendulum and the pendulum will continue, will continue to uh, swing and risk appetite and availability of capital is what, for the most part, not the only thing, for the most part that drives the swing. So to the extent people want to invest more money in the public markets in biotech and there are limited companies available, more companies will sense that and then they will go public earlier. Uh, sometimes way too early, and that you, you usually know that in retrospect. Uh, going public is not always a good thing. You know, it, 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 it becomes a burden for the management team. It can become very distracting. As a private company, if something goes wrong, you don't have to admit to the world everything that went wrong. You can just pivot and fix the company before you, before you go public. On the other hand, it is a source of capital. But, you know, if you can stay private longer and continue to raise the capital you need, it's generally a reasonable thing to do, you got to remember the stock price at the IPO means it means something in terms of dilution of current shareholders. 
yeah. but it doesn't mean anything for five years from now. And most of you can't sell anyway because you're all locked up. So yeah. you're know, going out and all of a sudden having a fifty dollars stock price, and then you know if two years later it's back to ten, who cared? I mean, what did you get out of that? Um, right, nothing. So. Yeah, so this is a good question to, to kind of kick on when, uh, as, as we're nearing the end here. So what do you see as some of the biggest opportunities for New York companies as to say, compared to say Massachusetts or the Bay Area? So one of the big benefits of New York is you have, uh, between New York and New Jersey, there, there's quite a lot of pharma developed talent um, that uh, can be deployed. People that can't, for one reason or another, move to Boston. Uh, you, know, they're, you know, their spouse doesn't want to move for for, for example, and while you can commute, it's not the same. The, the same thing. So no. I think talent, talent is certainly one of the things where New York stands out. And I think for later, certainly for later stage companies, if you're trying to put together a clinical development operation, you're going to find people in New York, New Jersey. I think much quicker mm -hmm. than you're in Boston. Second thing is, it used to be New York was a lot more expensive than Boston. I don't know if that's the case any longer yeah. uh, because rents have gone up salaries have gone up everything has gone up and there, you know, mm -hmm. once again there's a lot lack of talent and the and the traffic around boston i, I don't want to it feels like it's even worse than new york i, I mean if that's possible um so um i think the the playing field is becoming more level i know there are activities new york bio is probably involved in some of those uh you know to make tax breaks and some funding available laboratory space all the things that you need uh, mm -hmm. to incentivize uh, the industry. But the one thing that works really well in Boston, and I'm not sure how to do it in New York, is, is you've got a small, this small geographic area mm -hmm. where it's yeah. highly yep. concentrated. And if there was a way to do that in New York, uh, you know, beyond just one building, uh, you know, it, you know, you know, but th if there was like almost like this large campus and it was next to a, you know, a medical institution, uh, maybe that exists and I'm just not familiar, but those would be things that would help New York along. And then the, the last problem is a problem that I don't know what to deal with, but it's the general problem we're all facing right now. If state and city taxes on income taxes continue to go up and you have a, you have a choice, you know, where you're going to live, you might not choose New York. I mean, you, you see hedge funds and hedge funds, you know, and long only funds moving to Florida. You see California companies moving to Texas. You know, Boston's got a 5.1% tax rate. New York's got a, what, 13% tax rate, yeah. whatever it is, right? It matters. Yeah. It really matters. And um, I don't know what the answer is there, but it, it, it is one of, you have to, we have to admit, it is one of the roadblocks. Yeah. You know, and I, I think in New York where, it was funny, when I got here like three years ago-ish, you know, that the, we're coming off of that, there's not enough lab space. We don't have enough incubator space, right? And and so a lot of that's been solved for. I, I think we'll end up having many clusters, right? Like mini Cambridges in different areas, because New York is so spread mm -hmm. out. We'll have Long Island mm -hmm. City and we'll have, yep. you know, up near Columbia and then we'll have the West Side and the East Side Corridor, Alexandria up to Rockefeller. And um, so I think we'll have different spaces, but I think we'll, we'll get that. But I think it's a longer development than you're developing one area of Cambridge. <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah. So I think New York, New York will continue to grow. I think it, uh, Certainly, if uh, the Googles and the Disney's and everybody keep moving, it will attract other technology, other technologies and technology people that like technology. So I think New York's on a pretty good track. I don't know how COVID has changed that. I don't know. I'm not close enough to the politics. Um, I'm not a big fan of the current mayor. I don't know whether he's been helpful or hurtful. Um, but hopefully, whoever the next person is, they will recognize bringing technology to New York is a good thing. Yeah, well, one of the things that we absolutely can say is that the uh, the team at the New York City Economic Development Corporation has been fantastic. Uh, they're incredibly supportive, uh, you know, and they've they've put together the the five hundred million dollar, uh, you know, LifeSci NYC initiative. That's been really really successful. Um, we have you know we have more real estate popping up, whether it's in Long Island City, which I think probably has the potential to have some of the campus aspects that you talked about. Um, but there's, you know, there's news popping up left, right, and center uh, for where things are, are coming up in the city. So, um, yeah, so it sounds it, like it sounds like it's going in a really good direction. Yeah. We feel good about it. Uh, honestly, there there's a lot of good news coming. Like you said, there's there's available capital. We have uh, we've seen really good things out of you know the the public markets. We see you know great ability to create companies here. 
uh, and there's a really good and supportive environment. So, you know, as somebody who's been in New York for 15 years now, I can say that there's been, um, I really think a groundswell of activity that has really just, you know, just almost doubled on itself every year for the past five years or so. So there's a lot of really good things happening in New York City. And, cool. you know, one of the, uh, we do, uh, we do have somebody that, that chimed in that said, you know, not a question. I'm from Queens, but I now live in Boston. The traffic is worse in Boston. It's just a smaller area to have traffic in. Thank you for attending my TED talk. So <laughs> like, yeah. like no, they're, correct. Else, I, they're correct. They're correct. They're correct. They're not wrong. Yeah, this, when you're in a small space, it's fun while you're growing until you reach the limits of that, you know, when you reach the limits of the box or the, the balloon or whatever it is, it becomes a problem, right? And that's what they're experiencing. That's right. Um, well, we actually, um, we have a, a sort of a, we'll give you a thoughtful question to, to wrap up on one from our audience. It says, based on your extensive CEO experiences, what of your prior experiences best prepared you for the role you have now helping found companies and grow them? <laughs> oh, there's so many. Um, yeah, I'm not even sure where to start. I'll tell you about one early in my career. Um, so I wanted to, uh, you know, I was on this track to eventually become, I hope to become head of marketing. That was, that was sort of the career goal. And um, the guy who was head of marketing at the time who was making the promotion didn't really care for me, but I think got pressure from somebody in Switzerland to promote me. So he says, okay, congratulations. <laughs> you're, in, you're in charge of this new franchise. It was Lamisil, Sand Immune, Sandostatin, Sandagotha. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he said, oh, by the way, every, all the brand managers on all those products are being reassigned. Good luck. Um, <laughs> and, and, and what I learned very, you know, so my first instinct, you know, of course, you know, you're getting lots of phone calls and emails <laughs> and there's burning fires all over the place and presentations that need to be made and sales forces that need to be fed. And I learned very quickly, you have to spend the time to go out and hire great people and develop them. And uh, it's the only, that's, it, that's one of those moments in your career when you, you go, aha, uh -huh, it is actually all, all about people. So that's just one example. I don't know if it's the most pivotal, pivotal one, but it was certainly one of the pivotal ones. Probably the other one that was more, um, a little more current is when they said, started an oncology business in this company and I had, and it was global in scale. I had never done anything outside the US. Mm -hmm. I had research, I had development, everything but manufacturing inside the organization. And I had to build a global company. And once again, putting the team together and learning how to plan and build a high performing team, uh, you know, was another pivotal moment. Seeing it's, a lot of it is around seeing the power of people and how you organize those people for best effect. How do, you, yeah. how do you motivate them? How do you organize them? How do you keep on track of their work? How do you incentivize them? How do you get to know them personally enough that you know, they feel connected to you, but you don't step over the line and they don't become your best friend so that when you have to fire them, you know, it's not a problem. All, all those kinds of things. All right. Well, David, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Uh, we really appreciate you coming and spending time with us this morning. Um, you know, we look forward to, uh, to the next things that come out of flagship. I was excited by the, uh, the endless RNA, uh, announcement yesterday. So you guys, so that, great that is a I've... really, really good one. I mean, that's, you know, you, that's, that's in that, you know, that top decile of ideas, I think um, that's yeah. going to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, we're exciting. Glad that you were able to spend time with us and the audience today. We had lots of questions, um, which is fantastic. So we thank you for uh, sharing your time with us. Good. Thank, yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, thanks Derek. Thanks right, and bye have bye. a great day, everyone. Bye, bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.